When I started in PC, I couldn't walk 500 steps, now I'm walking miles. I couldn't get down on the ground, now I'm doing planks and push-ups. Two charities, our amazing charity partners. A great round of applause to our charity partners. They provide, through your help, vital research into blood cancer treatment. Enjoy your, your meals when they, when they arrive. We help address environmental problems. We aid end-of-life care. We fight hunger worldwide. This is what you are doing whilst you are doing burpees and, and sweating with Coach Valbo. So give yourselves a round of applause for them. Now, I hope this is a better experience than the virtual galas that I've managed to perform. I was wearing the same outfit, obviously, so you know who I am. But it turns out nothing can stop a peaker. We are all so proud of everything we've done together and we continue to provide this platform. We've grown from 2015 from, from selling t-shirts to by funding or, or supporting charities to now, look at us, over 83 different countries, over 14,000 peakers, it's probably more by now. Six million dollars over, six million dollars raised. That's what, you've done. That's what you guys have done. So I want to say a huge thank you to each and every one of you, to, to each speaker, but also to ambassadors who you guys really have helped support. You've been a, a, a messenger for us. So thank you to all the, the ambassadors all around the world. I would like to list them all, but there are hundreds. But I want to say a huge thank you also to our amazing team who have made all this possible. It's been crazy, they're all jet lagged, they're all exhausted, but they're ready to party with you guys tonight. So can I say a huge thank you to the NPC team. Mama J.
woman that brought all the, all the tunes, all the vibes. We should get her to Jane tonight. So we're not ready. Coach Elizabeth. And of course, that's, that's the womanhood right there. That's the sisterhood. I love this. But also Joshua and Daniel. Every morning, very early. It's very hairy. Oh. Is it Coach Val? First day on Saturday, planting trees, all the, all the support workers, all the guys from One Tree Planted, huge thank you to those guys. To the guys from EDA, thank you gentlemen. All our coaches have looked after today. You're like to start eating, don't worry about it. So did you enjoy the tree planting? Yes, I really did. It's something that I really wanted to do. For a long time I've been harassing Alex about planting a wee forest, we've got more than that. We've got an amazing orchard. So thank you to Stuart, who did all the hard work, and his wife, <laughs> digging the holes. I'd love to see that I dug the holes, but I dug the holes, but I didn't. Um, it was great. I'm still washing mud out of my nails. Um, should have worn some gloves. But as you know, we've all partnered up with One Tree Planted this year. Yes, go on. Give me a round of This year, in support of their mission to help global reforestation efforts and make it simple for anyone to help the environment by planting trees, restore forests, create habitat for biodiversity, and make an impact in our world. So, before we welcome our first guest, I'm, I'm so excited for you guys to meet him, Matt Hill, the chief environmental evangelist of One Tree Planted. We're gonna find out a little bit of the great work they do, so here is a little introduction to one tree planted. In 2017 and 2018, British Columbia was devastated by the largest wildfire seasons in its history. This was a catastrophic event. I've never seen anything like it. Fires continue to burn across BC. Yeah. It's like a war. But containing the fires was only the beginning of a massive effort to prepare the province for future disasters. I think it was a real big wake up call for a lot of people. These wildfire events created an opportunity to restructure the forest. The climate is going to be in a very different place in 100 years. So how do you help make these forests more resilient? We're seeing a shift with our industry partners because we can solve the climate conundrum economically as well as ecologically. So what happens after the new cycle moves on? And who are the people on the front lines of this work? Guys, here we are. Matt, take a seat. Thank you. 
you've been you've been busy this weekend. Yeah. But wasn't it a great week? Wasn't it a great day on Saturday? Amazing day. I mean, Scotland's so beautiful. That spot was epic. That we're all. I want to thank everybody who came out and planted the trees. You guys were amazing. Yeah. Everybody was just so friendly. Great conversations. And I fly all over the world. And where we were on Saturday is the nicest spot I've ever planted. Oh wow! That's saying something because um, because you have. Planted all over the world. You've been in Costa Rica, um, you've been Brazil, in Peru. We planted in Australia, California. Yeah, wow. Well, Scotland, Scotland. Obviously, we were in North Berwick there, and you saw Bass Rock out to the out to the, the sea. You had Berwick Law on the left, and um, it's it's a really beautiful part of Scotland. So, Matt, tell me, and I know this might sound like a stupid question, but what is One Tree Planted? And wait, where were you founded? How did you start this this whole movement? It's a charity out of Vermont, and I just wanted to make it simple for people to help the environment. I feel that a lot of people felt paralyzed. It's too big of a challenge, I can't do that. When you look online, it is very technical, very dated, so people did nothing. So I wanted to make it more inspirational, positive, you can make an impact, and everybody here, together we're planting a forest. So I didn't know a lot about forests, so I just researched, I and mean, I just came back from California, it was with CAL FIRE, these resource conservation districts, and I said, one day I'm going to give you guys millions of dollars. But I absorbed a lot of information, and when people donate, we provide funding to these great organizations who have been doing critical work for decades, but people don't know about them. So now we're planting in over 43 countries around the world. Wow. Yeah. Oh, and, yes. But again, it's some people like you that are the catalysts that get people like you to get involved and learn about the importance. And you mentioned your six pillars, but when you plant a tree, we say the six pillars, it's helping with air quality, water quality, biodiversity, it's creating jobs, it's helping with climate, stabilizing climate, and it's helping with overall health. I mean, we work with a lot of athletes, and when you're planting trees and creating canopy cover, cover you know, you're, you're helping with air quality, it's helping with health in so many ways. Yeah, yeah, well as the smoke billows across the stage here, I hope we're not on fire, but, but, uh, but I mean, obviously, I mean, there are more fires recently, we've seen them in California, we've seen them all over in Australia, you know, um, where, how, do you, how do you choose the places that you plant? Is there, it, it, you know, what country and what species as well? Sure, so, I mean, I have an incredible team of One Tree Plant, I mean, I have to thank the incredible team that helped work with you guys to put yes, this together. Yes, thank you to the team that helped. So, thank you to them. And, the most I've ever had come out for a volunteer event is 165 people, and yesterday, on Saturday, there was 800. So, I mean, I have to admit, there are lines of apple trees, there are lines of pear trees, there are lines of apple, pear, cherry, whatever. Yeah, well, random. You guys have to no. thank Stuart, because he dug yes. the holes, because most of the time you have to dig the hole. So, a lot of people will be sore today if it wasn't for Stuart putting those holes in to make it a lot easier for you. But in terms of the projects, the forest fires, so if you think the West Coast, you get experience a lot of forest fires. Climate's changing, but we all see it. Um, so we're looking at tree species that are going to be there in the next five years, ten years. Are these types of trees going to be able to you know, deal with the droughts and these forest fires. We're doing fuel load reduction. So they're the experts in the field in Australia, in that particular region, and they tell us. And we've done projects where we've tried something, call it experimentation, so it's native tree species, yeah. but they're trying to figure things out because things are changing really fast that we can all experience every day, right? More severe hurricanes, more heavier forest fires that are going on. And we look at the budget in terms of site preparation, the tree species that they need to plant, um, the cost for the labor, and then the monitoring, the maintenance that's going on. And then we vet them very thoroughly. And then we send the funding and milestones, making sure that you just don't want your dollar, your hard work to go and hope for the best, right? So we want to get those progress reports. We want, we're using a lot of satellite technology and drone technology so that you can really see what happened to my tree that's planted. That's yeah. survived. So how do you plant a tree for a dollar? I mean, how does that happen? It depends on the region of the world. Some places have like lower labor costs. Right. I mean, Europe's been very challenging. And so I always said we plant four regions around the world, North America, South America, Asia, Africa. It's so only last year that we got into Europe because Europe doesn't have these larger type scale nurseries. Labor costs are hard and harder. So we've been trying to figure it out. But when a dollar comes in and we have this pool of funding, and we'll come to the UK, for example, 
project's been on the back burner, and our funding is the catalyst to get it started. So it's called co-funding, right? right. co-blended financing. So the, the regional partner will have some funding. We give that. Maybe there's a government match that gets the project right. going, right. going. But in British Columbia, where you just saw that video, I mean, they plant over 400 million trees every season. Like 400, 400 million, million trees. Yeah, they're a machine, right? Yeah. yeah. So they really know what they're doing. I do a lot of site visits with them, and when we go to the Amazon rainforest or spots in Asia, we're not there to dictate to them or just give them money. We want to provide more than funding, like the resources, the help. We give them drones for free. We train them how to, to fly the drones so that we can understand the landscape and where there's critical corridors that might need something more. So again, to answer your question, not be long-winded, we rely on the experts on the field that our team works with them. A lot of them have their masters in forestry, and we're just trying to understand this all together. Wow, it's, I mean, just listening to that, it's incredible, isn't it? And, and what an amazing job you do. But so, so can I ask, firstly, how many trees have you planted? Not personally, but as, as, as your, um, your... Our organization's planted over 40 million trees to date. <laughs> it a little bit differently to make it more inspiring, more simple, more getting people like you involved, right? Because there's a lot of critical work that's needed out there. And I think next by next year, we'll plant it over 100 million trees in total. Wow. Wow. And what about, do we know already, obviously we planted a thousand trees yesterday. By, by comparison, it doesn't sound many, but I think NPC, we've, We've already rated, we've already planted quite a few with you guys. Yeah, I mean, hundreds of thousands is going to continue to grow. We're going to do the MPC forest, and we're going to be doing millions of trees. We're going to continue. Right? You want to go see that? Yeah. yeah. Um, but you know what? It's those projects here in Scotland that we did that are my favorite. The thousand, five thousand tree projects because. It's these organizations that often go overlooked. And, you know, I go to a lot of big conferences and they're always talking to these massive scale mega restoration projects. And five years later, I haven't even seen a tree go on the ground. They just talk, talk, talk. So I get frustrated with that. So yeah. I want to work and say, I'd rather go out tomorrow and get 2,000 trees in the ground or 20,000 trees in the ground. Go back. We use a term at our company called continuous improvement. It might not be perfect. But we're going in and you're seeing action, we're doing it. What's working well, what didn't work so well, what are we doing better for the next time? Well, I mean, I know many peakers came up to me and said how much like fun they, they had, but also they really had a takeaway from it. They really enjoyed it. So what, what, is, the, what is the number one thing they can do to, to get involved? Is there something? That, that yeah, get your hands in the dirt like you did on Saturday. Keep doing that, this right? Where everybody's from all over the world, can you go back home and do that there? And finally, Matt, just... What, what are the plans? What's, what's in the future? I mean, you know, I think, I don't know about everyone else here, but you know, I get nervous about climate change, I get nervous about the future, but it's people like yourself doing, doing great work, getting out there and, and making a, a difference, you know, what, what are your long distance goals? Or I just, it's small little steps that everybody here can do that, you know, make a difference, because collectively, you know, it's compound and makes a difference, but you know, to me, it's been build the brand, build the brand. You know, it's not about, okay, I have to be the biggest or I have to do 100 million trees. I mean, we're growing organically. My thing is, we have an, I have an amazing team. Corporate culture is so important. And that, you know, I don't have a job because I come into work every day loving what I'm doing. I get to meet people like you and all these, you know, peakers. So I love it. Wow. Man, I mean, it really is an absolute pleasure. We love working with you. We can't wait to, to support you and your efforts in the future. Um, anything else you want to add to our amazing speakers? I want to say thank you and thanks to everybody here for coming out to Scotland. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you for coming to Scotland. Matt and all of your team that are here. Table six, no, not six, yeah. Table 70. Thank you for all the hard work you do. Really appreciate it. Matt, you're a gentleman. Come on, let's hug it out. He's now going to hug each and every one of you. Good luck with that, Matt. <laughs> Thank you. Huge round of applause for Matt. <laughs> and one tree planted. And it is so great because obviously Matt works all around the world, but to see Matt here in Scotland. Yes. And it's great to see you guys back in Scotland. And I know we've had a number of challenges over the past couple of years during the pandemic, but like our Pika community, 
You guys are resilient. Scotland's resilient. And we're back. Someone play the video. Can you be wrecked without mountains? Can you be wrecked without sea? Can you be wrecked without wildlife? Is that the way wretches should be? What is the value of flowers? And what is the value of air? Would we really profit if none of that was there? This is a country of wretches worth far more than pounds and pence. If you could invest in the future, this is the place that makes sense. Scotland's always been inventive, always aiming high, supporting leaps in science, helping ideas fly. We're learning for the future, acting now for what's ahead. We're standing up for what's right and saying what must be said. Because we are a place of equals and we are creating things anew. It may not be easy, but that is what we do. Keith Mila Thalcha. These are words that we hold dear. We are Scotland and good things live here. If you share these feelings too, Scotland's waiting and open to you. Ladies and gentlemen, Peekers, Balbo, please welcome <laughs> Angus Robertson, Scotland's Cabinet Secretary of External Affairs and Culture. It's a wonderful title. <laughs> Angus! We like your trues you've got on there. Thanks very much. Are they fabulous? Thank you. Peekers, this is Angus Robinson. Um, you are Scotland's Cabinet Secretary of External Affairs and Culture. It's okay, no problem. What does that mean? <laughs> well, it means I get invited to tremendous yes. evenings like this. So, so thank happy. you to you. We are very, very happy that you're here. Thank you for coming along. We just want to ask, you know, how important it is to promote Scotland internationally and, and how does Scotland want to be viewed in the rest of the world? We are such a, a, a bonny wee country, but we've got a great, a great spirit and a great personality. We do, and I think, I'm interested in this audience here because I get a funny feeling there's quite a lot of people here who are not from Scotland. Hands up if you're not from <laughs> Scotland. Wow. Oh, look at that. Wow. Fantastic. So, first off, thank you all for coming. Yes, you're very welcome. Thank you. I would say Scotland thank you. Well. A round of applause to all of you. We won't say thank you very much. We might no, 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 no. That'll take up the rest of the evening. Yes. Um, we're an outward looking country. We're a country that we think is worth visiting. Yes. And we have cultures that we know are exciting for people. And obviously, that's one of the reasons why people are here. So, we've got a job to do, as do all countries who are trying to bounce back from COVID. Yes and we're trying to make sure that people are coming back. So now that you've been here as peakers, I would love you to come back for the Edinburgh Festival, yes. or the Glasgow Film Festival, and all of the tremendous cultural organizations and events that take place in this country, and it'll be the start of a beautiful relationship. Uh, I mean, I'm obviously you know, biased, but I love Scotland. I, uh, I'm also part of this wee TV show. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's, it's, so we show. Well, can I? Sorry to interrupt yes. you because I, I'm aware that today is quite an important day. Is now, it? It is. It is. It's an important day. Now I don't know how many of you know that the gentleman sitting me next to me is actually 301 years old today. You have done your maths. Sam, your real birthday yes. was yesterday, it was. but you weren't 301. So, regardless of which age you are, I'm going to embarrass you by asking everybody to join me in singing oh. happy birthday. That would be happy tonight. birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. To me and Jamie. Happy birthday, dear Sam and Jamie. Sam and Jamie. Happy birthday. Festival that goes on around that up on Carlton Hill, and there's 
witches and burning effigies and it's uh, a real celebration also of the, the change of I guess winter into spring or summer and I know some peakers were in there last night wow surprise yourself sitting or standing um, but yes and, and that was you know a great wee event but as you mentioned yourself you know we have Edinburgh Festival we, we, we do but let, let me tell you something about your show because you're too, too modest um, yeah. The phenomenon of Outlander is is genuinely a Scottish cultural phenomenon, and I'm guessing some of the people in the audience not are not just speakers; they're also fans of Outlander. Am I right? So, there you go. Now, about fifty percent. So. Yeah, here's just two facts for you. One in five of all people who visit Scotland do so because they've seen it on television or in film. Fact one. Fact two, if you go to Visit Scotland, our National Tourism Authority's website, consistently amongst the top three searches in Visit Scotland oh, is Outlander. I was wondering where you're going to go. <laughs> And, and what that tells us is people have seen your show and all of the series that have gone on uh, before and they want to see where it's filmed, they want to see where the action's taking place and they want to visit and see that. So on behalf of everybody in the audience, another thank you to you. You have popularised Scotland, you've popularised Scottish history and Scottish culture, you brought it to life and you're encouraging all of us to see all these amazing places that are, appear in the, in the series and that's worth one round of applause. So a round of applause for that please. No, please, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at my question and like, no, Alex didn't write anything here. Like, Let Angus do it. Just, just one, other wee, one other wee fact. If you go back in, in recent history, unfortunately, Scottish film and television has not been as productive, as successful as it should be, given the amazing stars and actors we know who've, who've made it internationally. We, we haven't broken through... Um, in film and TV production in Scotland in a big way. This all changed yeah. with Outlander. Yeah. And you're now what? You're now in Series 7? S we are. We should Series now, 7. Yeah. And at the same time, because you've been so groundbreaking, it's given other people confidence. So we've, uh, we've got a huge studio that's open in Leith here in, right. in, in Edinburgh. We've got a huge studio in West Lothian that is fil has been filming at the present time. You guys are obviously in Cumbernauld, we've got a, a big studio opening in Glasgow, and this is just the start, so um, we, we owe, we Scotland, we owe you and your colleagues a lot in terms of showing that it's possible to make world-class series, world-class yeah. films, um, making it fly and make, make Scotland so popular that more and more companies, I mean Marvel for example have just finished right. the, the entire latest Batgirl film in Glasgow. Glasgow. There you go. I probably a secret, I probably should say that. We're getting killed by an elf tomorrow, but, um, but it is, it's amazing, we're attracting lots, and it's because we have these great locations, obviously, yeah. but, but I think also the infrastructure now, we have, we're creating jobs, we're um, really revitalizing areas as well. So there, there, there's another example, so now we've got the studios, which is great, but one of the things that we need to make sure is that we've got young people coming through with talent. Yes. And that's one, one area where the, the Scottish Government, through our agency, uh, Screen Scotland, that, that promotes film and TV production, has been co-funding with uh, Outlander. Yeah. Uh, now, throughout the most recent series, all of the bright young talent that comes in that right. wants to break through into television and film. I think we're now looking at more than 170 youngsters that come through Outlander, and that's a tremendous news story, and that goes really well for the future. Yeah, the, the sort of apprenticeship scheme, and they, they come and they join us, and they, they work in, in, in uh, well, behind the scenes, and they really learn their craft there. And exactly. It's great. And, and for the first time, we're able to say to these youngsters that they will have a full career through life experience in Scotland with all these studios, with all these film and TV productions on the way. Yeah. They will always be able to work here. They don't need to go down to London. They can if they want, of course, or no, other studios in the time. States and elsewhere. No, I think we should all go internationally and then come back. But to actually have the opportunity to succeed in Scotland, yeah. as you've shown that it's possible to do, it will, it will make it possible for the next generation of young talent coming through. And I think we should celebrate that. Oh, we should. It, yes, it, it makes me so excited. 
and to be Scottish and to be part of this industry. So what, what have we got to look forward to in the future? What's, what are the plans ahead? Well, I'm not, the, I'm not a filmmaker. What I do know is that the Scottish Government and through Screen Scotland, we're doing everything that we can that we're, uh, we're trying to support getting new productions here, getting new series underway here. It's not just international productions. We're seeing some, some pretty big plans by domestic television producers, but also some pretty well-known Scottish film and TV stars who are wanting to do more here, which is hugely exciting. I, for one, I, I would really like to see a, a Scottish film school. We don't have that at the yeah, moment, and I'd like to see yeah. uh, young people with the talents, talents uh, that, that you obviously have, uh, be able to come through and get all the training and learn how to, uh, to do their craft so that fans, as there are here, the hundreds of you, will be able to see the next generations of Scottish talent, young men and women, making their way in film and TV. I think that'd be hugely exciting. I think you would. I think with, with people like yourself behind us, I think we're going to go a long way. And honestly, it's, uh, it really is a pleasure. I think I'm really proud of this wee country. And I think, you know, even in the past, you know, t 10 years, since I started out, I don't know, is it really 10 years? But I think it's really grown and changed the past. So, um, thank you, Angus. Anything else you wish to, to, to add to... No, all, all, all I would say is to all the peakers in the room, I take my hat off to you, I pass on the best wishes from uh, First Minister Nicola Sturgeon, you do great things, doesn't matter which or the four corners of this earth you come from, you're doing great things for charity and your own health obviously, you're always welcome back, please do come back and perhaps we'll see you at the, at the next gala event yes. in years to come, how about that? Bigger and better. A huge thank you to you all from coming from all around the world. Merci beaucoup. Oh my God. Thank you, Sean. Oh, here we go. Yes, we'll be here all night. So, thank you, Angus. Now, Peekers, we have all come to know and love our charity partner. One of the few that we support, but Blood Cancer UK over the past few years. They have supported us tremendously. Do you remember? I don't know if anyone was here a couple of years ago, the last gala we had. Walking around Arthur's seat. Yes, there's a few here. This pandemic has hit the people and families affected by cancer really hard, not surprisingly. But of course, the great people at Blood Cancer UK, with your continued support, continue to fight despite all of their challenges. We have a little video from Blood Cancer UK. Because research into blood cancer saved my life. Because this charity is founded from our kitchen table to save others going through the agonies that we went through. Because my boy lost his mum to blood cancer. Because I lost my husband to blood cancer. Because too many people still don't survive blood cancer and we can change that. Because Blood Cancer UK fund research and treatment for blood cancers, my mum still picked to death. And now I work for Blood Cancer UK, supporting the work that they do. Because I want to see a day where no child dies from blood cancer. Currently, 9 out of 10 children survive. We want to make it 10 out of 10 with new treatments. And my peak challenge is helping me to achieve it. Because blood cancer research saved my daughter's life. Because research means hope for our children in finding a cure for all blood cancers. <laughs> because when we play as a team, we're unstoppable. Because it's time to finish what my parents started.
Because it's time to beat blood cancer. Because it's time to beat blood cancer. Because it's time to beat blood cancer. Speakers, huge round of applause. Please welcome Rachel Khan and Matthew White from Blood Cancer UK. For an extra chair as well. Rachel, take a seat there, Matt. Take a night. Take the comfy seat. I'll take this. It looks, it looks comfortable. It's lovely. Welcome! Thank you very much. And welcome back, I guess, as well. We've yes. been very happy to support Black Cancer UK for the past few years. And for, I guess, I mean, the peakers that are here have been here before we heard that, but for new peakers, tell us a little bit about what, what Black Cancer UK does. Well, I think the first uh, thing that peakers should know is that we're incredibly proud that Black Cancer UK to be part of the peaker community. We really, it's actually a little bit overwhelming. We talk about you a lot in the office. We oh. see the videos, I follow you on social media, but to be here, like, the energy is incredible. So... You have some smiles as well. So, there are, there are hundreds of you here tonight, and I'm really conscious that there's one in 19 people who will be diagnosed with blood cancer in their life, and so hundreds of you here, there will be many people here that have stories of how blood cancer has affected their life, either directly, or their grandparents, parents, their children. So I'm really conscious that you know how tough blood cancer can be. There's 120 different types of blood cancer sound. Wow. There's leukemia, myeloma, lymphoma, um, many different types of blood cancer, and it can be it's the third biggest cancer killer in the UK, and it's the most common cancer in children. And in fact, Blood Cancer UK, we were started, as you saw, um, 60 years ago by a family who lost their child to blood cancer. And so, I know that. I didn't know yeah. That. Wow. And in those 60 years, their goal and our goal is to bring forward the day that no one dies of blood cancer. That's what we're aiming for. We are, we're making headway. And it's, we are, and it's because of the researchers tell us we think that with, within our generation, so within the next 30 years, that we can actually beat blood cancer. That's incredible. And it really is down to people like you, Sam, uh, your team, the peak is here, you coming together, fundraising for us so passionately, it really does make a difference. So, so a huge round of applause. Thank you. Rachel, we've been supporting you guys for a couple of years, and we just... I mean, we love you guys as charity partners. You really do. You bring the stories. You, we met Hugo uh, a couple of years ago. But where, where, do, where do the actual funds go um, that, that we help raise? Well, I can promise you that we put them to very good use. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for inviting us here tonight. Warm. It's amazing. You guys are incredible. I've been watching what you've been doing all weekend. It just looks absolutely amazing. Um, so what do we do? I mean, fundamentally, we fund really amazing, incredible research. So right now we have 82 research projects going on in the UK. Six, I'm sure you'll want to know, are in Scotland. Yeah. One of those is just four miles away from where we are tonight. And I'm delighted to say we're joined by Catherine Ottersbach this evening. Um, and she's our lovely researcher in Glasgow. Thank you, Catherine. researcher into childhood leukemia so she wants to understand why children really young children get leukemia which can be absolutely devastating for children and their families and what she does is she kind of tries to spot the difference between tumors so did you ever spot the difference as a child um, in a child? As a child, as oh, a child. I know, like, you know in a female, that's probably that as far as... You know what else can spot the difference as a child? You had two pictures, you had to find all the differences? Yeah? Yeah? yeah. yeah. Well, I did, I played it. And, and Christine does a really similar thing, but she does it in the lab, and she, what she's trying to do is find really subtle differences between children with cancer. And what she does by that is she can tell how, how one child's cancer is likely to develop, uh, what treatment will work, wow. and by understanding that, she can kind of make sure every child gets the right treatment as soon as possible and gives them the best possible chance of survival, which is amazing. Wow, that's good. Yeah. 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 And so I mentioned earlier that um, 
Hugo, who we met, and actually his brother as well, I think, uh, a couple of years ago. And, and how is Hugo? Do we know? You're closer to Hugo than I am. Right? He's doing really, really well. Yeah. yeah. He's thriving, which is amazing. He did have a really hard time with it. Um, yeah. So, for those of you who don't know, he was diagnosed with leukemia when he was much younger. For a while, he couldn't walk, he was in a wheelchair, but now he's. He's out of his wheelchair, he's thriving. His mum actually works for the charity now at oh, the moment. Oh, that's, that's amazing. fantastic. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, he's doing really good work. Yes, Walk around after seed as well, so that was that was great fun. Um, I think they're on the main course. Um, so we must talk about the Munro Step Challenge. Yes. Now a lot, a lot of you partake in that. I've seen you go on steps. Balbo doesn't do it because it's too much like cardio, but um, but we enjoy it. Matt, what are the plans for the, the Step Challenge in the future? Well, we know that the beakers love. So this year we're going to set probably the highest bar you possibly could. We want the peakers to walk around the world. So that will be nice. Blood Cancer UK is all about community. We want the Blood Cancer and PICA community to come together and the PICA community to collectively walk around the world. So we're going to be, it's going to be a great launch. You have to look out in August. There's some great, very exciting news that we'll be bringing you in August. And it'll be a collective challenge. You can all come together and travel the world. And what's great about it is every single metre travel will make a difference. So you can travel a long way, a short way, and it will all add up. So it's all going to be virtually, but you're going to add up, add up the steps, and we'll try and walk all the way around the world. 40,000 kilometers. 40,000 kilometers. Just, just looking back the last two years, you know, we've obviously been through the pandemic. It's been extremely difficult for everyone. But I mean, Rachel, you know, how how has this affected people with blood cancer? It has really affected them massively. So people with blood cancer, their cancer, there's their condition means that they don't have an immune system. Yeah. So when COVID became a thing, all of a sudden they were told, you've got to stay indoors, you can't go outside, and their lives completely changed, as it did for all of us. But you know, they are particularly vulnerable. And you know, even when the world started opening up for us and we started to go outside again, you know, we can start to enjoy amazing events like this again. Yeah. People with blood cancer are still indoors because the vaccines might not work as well for them. They're still very vulnerable. And actually, really sadly, one in 22 deaths from COVID is in people with blood cancer at the moment. Yeah. But having said that, the, our support services, the demand for our support services over the last two years have gone up massively. And the only reason we have been able to cater towards that is thanks to people like you. You are the reason we can support those people and you know support them through a really, really tough time. And we can lobby politicians, sorry Angus, to make sure that people with blood cancer are still you know, on the agenda and get the protection they need. Um, so a massive thank you to you for letting us continue to support people when they really, really need it. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you for all the great work you do. It is exceptional work. Um, is there anything else you're, you're looking forward to in the future? Anything uh, apart from the STEM challenge? I'm getting my walking shoes out. Um, really can't thank you enough for both of you for coming and joining us. Um, your researchers as well. Huge, huge thank you. So a huge round of applause to I don't know if I've gone too fast or too slow, Alex. A little, little fast? You guys are still getting your main course, I see. Okay. Well, I'll just keep talking. How you all doing? Well, I mean, I have to say, it really has been an amazing weekend. I can't uh, thank you all enough, not only for making my birthday very, very special, um, but for making this gala so special. You guys really have brought a great community together, uh, a great energy. Uh, I know it's been a, a long couple of days, but from, from all of us at NPC, we can't thank you enough for all the, the support that you give us, the, um, the, the relentless energy. I don't know where you guys get it from, but it's because you are peakers. 
That's what makes you so special. Thank you for supporting yourselves, but also supporting others. So keep up the good work. I'm really excited for this. Thank you. 